Yeah, so um, without further ado, let me move on to um, telling you first that this talk will be about inclusive fitness theory. That's all in the background. It comes in two um, kind of um, waves. The first, of course, 50 years ago, developed by Bill Hamilton, and then Trevor's 10 years later formulated parent-offspring conflict, the idea that there is this zone of conflict about parental investment where um, mothers are on the selection to stop provisioning offspring earlier than offspring would like to have that. It's the whole idea of also behind SIP competition. And then um, um, one or two decades later, David Haig and Bernie Crespi, who you just both heard speak, um, started to um, develop genomic imprinting theory. Um, in particular, the, uh, the idea um, that Bernie briefly mentioned at the beginning, developed together with Christopher Badcock, um, is what will be behind much of what I will be presenting here today. So what we really did in Denmark is exploit the, um, the enormous public uh, health databases that are available for researchers. Uh, you need to go to a lot of pa permit paperwork but then you can get access to essentially the entire health record of the population of 5 million, and that goes back um, usually for up to 30 years now. And we've recently published two papers, um, and I had originally planned to take you through most of both of them, but I will cut the first one very short to stay in time. So the first one is about parent-offspring conflict. The other one is using hypotheses about genomic imprinting and copy number variation um, as that um, gets back into birth weights and possibly predicts uh, risks of contracting diagnosis for schizophrenia and autism later in life. So um, lots of this revolves around the placenta as a conceptual battleground for parent-offspring conflict um, because essentially um, fetal tissue has the possibility to, um, to manipulate provisioning uh, that way. And we addressed uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and as that can get worse into preeclampsia, as that is a disease which is essentially unexplained in terms of etiology and is persistently with us across the globe, affecting 5 to 10 percent of pregnancies worldwide. So for this study, we had three quarters of a million of um, birth available, up to 27 years of follow-up, potential confounding variables, about 16 that we could adjust for, and 14 categories of diseases, which is essentially everything you can get diagnosed with except accidents, where we didn't hypothesize there would be an evolutionary link, but maybe that was premature, I don't know. Um, so here's a single slide summarizing what we found. So if you have um, basically a mother that was preeclamptic, you see that to the right here, then essentially offspring have enhanced risks for being diagnosed with almost any disease, and that's significant. So it's not only mothers that suffer from preeclampsia, it's also the children born from that. But if it didn't get that bad, but you got enhanced blood pressure during pregnancy in the later trimesters of your pregnancy, also that had smaller but consistently enhanced disease risks. But remarkably what we found is when pregnancy-induced hypertension only occurs at the beginning of pregnancy and disappears, those children are more than average healthy and that is for, again, across the board. Now many of these Bars were by themselves not significant, but when we did like a meta-analysis combining the probabilities, the difference between having preeclampsia in the first versus it continuing in the second or popping up in the second trimester was highly significant. So really, that is a result that we feel is consistent with parent-offspring conflict theory because if there is a consistent benefit of a fetal manipulation early in, pre in pregnancy, drawing more resources out of the mother, but the mother is actually able to meet that demand and reach a stable equilibrium, 
it is perhaps a better situation and not having that, that challenge at all during pregnancy. So the important thing is this is met by about the time that the placenta is fully grown and growth of the embryo is really taken off. So the rest of my time I will use on the second study, which essentially is testing what I would call now after having heard Bernie speak maybe the first generation of their theory about um, risks of schizophrenia and autism, which focused on genomic imprinting and copy number variation being uh, important for determining risks of being diagnosed with these diseases later in life. And they published this paper on that in Nature, outlining the theory in two pages in 2008. And having the possibility to get access to these enormous data sets, we decided to put that to the test. And that work was done in large measure by Sean Byers, who is the first author here. Steve Stearns is involved in that. And Sean will be talking tomorrow, and so will Steve. But the upshot of the theory, as we try to basically summarize, is something like this. There is, of course, um, if you have the diametric opposite axis here that Bernie talked about, there is an average of normal condition, mentalism. Then you have an extreme of autism, and maybe the mild forms is what we call abstract talents, nerd, nerdy talents. If you go this way, you go to the, oh, to the extreme of schizophrenia, but there is the social talents and the mild forms here. So the hypothesis that we tested, is it possible that in fact birth size is a predictor of these risks? So that some of these imprints uh, affect placental functioning as they do uh, brain functioning when children grow up. And so here are basically is the axis from going from small babies to large babies. Here is the environmental effects. Here is the direct genetic effects that Bernie was talking about that may have an effect. So here is the possible imbalances in imprinted genes towards the maternal side. But the paternal side delivering heavier babies if that would be coinciding with risk of autism so the prediction goes, and also babies that are more demanding on their mothers after they've been born, and it's the opposite here. So here we had an even larger data set, more possible confounding variables, and close to 100,000 individuals that were diagnosed with a mental disease, one, at least one diagnosis, and one or the other. So before going on, we try to validate this idea that you can actually use birth weight to make predictions about um, imprinting and copy number variation effects, hypothesized facts, later in life by looking at uh, four well-known uh, imprinting-related um, diseases, back with Wiedemann syndrome, Silver Russell syndrome, uh, Engelmann syndrome, and prader willi syndrome, because there it is very clear that there are directional mental disease risks and they are, have been connected to imprinting uh, imbalances. And so what we tested is whether in fact you could find a contrast in birth weight and birth lengths there. And it's a bit hard to see maybe, but in all cases, um, the ones that we expected to have uh, be born heavier or longer, in fact, were so and that those contrasts with the other extreme were always significant. So here then is a central result of that we obtained. Um, as we expected, um, we got the um, diametral opposite kind of thing uh, that was predicted. Um, so there is autism spectrum general category. That's the thick lines here. And then there is either broader or narrower diagnosis in the same category. And as you can see, that when you go up in birth weight, the increase, the risk of autism increases and the risk of schizophrenia spectrum diagnosis decreases. And if you go the other way, you see those lines continuing, except when you reach the really underweight babies that essentially have enhanced risk of both type of mental diseases. 
And when we used birth length in, instead of birth weight, we got an even clearer picture. And again, here it starts to sort of uh, lose its diametral, diametrical signature when you get to the really underweight babies. That's not something new. We knew that. But it's interesting to see that the relative risk for schizophrenia still is a lot higher than the relative risk for autism. So there is still a relative protection against autism when you're born um, way below average. So here's a quick and messy table about all the conf potentially confounding variables that we tested. Um, I just run you through a few of them that are interesting. First, the sex of the baby. There was really an opposite um, sort of factor that we needed to adjust for, which confirms what is, what is in fact known, that males are more sort of susceptible to being diagnosed with autism and females more susceptible to being diagnosed with schizophrenia type ailments. Um, we adjusted for the fact that both of these type of disorders run in families. So um, put in dummy variables when the mother had the same type of mental disease or the father. And in fact, as you can see from the red squares, that of course had an effect confirming what is known about um, genetic components of these diseases. And Bernie just addressed some of uh, the latest work on that. And the final thing that um, we found interesting was that there were effects of paternal and maternal age. Paternal age basically appeared to increase risk for both um, types of disorders, although more strongly for the autism types than for the schizophrenic types, whereas maternal age had um, a different effect for autistic and for schizophrenic um, type of diseases. So older mothers have an increased risk of getting uh, autistic children and decreased risk of having schizophrenic children. So let me wrap up. This was really, um, this is a summary basically. We had a very clear prediction based on that Batcock and Cresme paper that is to the left here. And in essence, this is what we found. But it was particular intriguing that because the data set was so huge that we in fact um, were able to show that this diametric pattern was significant for the center of the distribution, the two thirds of all babies that are born uh, with, within one standard deviation of the mean. And this, these are babies that are considered to be totally normal in birth weight. And even though in absolute numbers, the increase and decrease of risks are very small, they were consistently significant. So if I if you allow me to wrap up, there's essentially four conclusions that I wrote down here. Um, autistic and schizophrenic um, disorders do seem to be, in this huge Danish data set, opposite extreme of a single mental disorder gradient, as has been hypothesized. Our results match earlier public health studies looking at these things in smaller data sets, or if there were large data sets, looking at them one by one and not combining the two so they had no chance to really see that diametric pattern. The results also match that a well-known fact that very low birth sizes essentially increase risks for any mental disorder plus a, a whole lot of other type of health problems. And uh, quite satisfactory, actually, the results appear to be robust for variation in the classification of these mental disease diagnoses um, because no matter whether we look at the overall spectrum patterns or we look at the subcategories of these diseases, usually the lines were pretty parallel. So really, a um, few conclusions and, and perspectives. Both studies indicate that inclusive fitness logic helps to make at least partial sense of complex diseases. Uh, like preeclampsia, schizophrenia, and autism. Um, the public health databases in the Nordic countries, um, they are really uh, a goldmine for doing this kind of work. Also because 
anonymized, you can in fact combine them with all the socio-economical variables that you usually want to correct for. Um, but of course, this is all consistency evidence. We know far too little about the proximate mechanisms and the single genes that do this, so we need more research in that direction. And with that, I'll stop and just show two acknowledgments of the things that funded. Thank you.